Good afternoon. Welcome to the Heritage Foundation and our Lewis Lehrman Auditorium. We, of course, welcome those who join us on our heritage.org website on all of these occasions. I would ask everyone here in-house if you'll be so kind to check cell phones one last time to see that they've been turned off. Uh, courtesy is always appreciated by our speakers and those recording our program. We will, of course, post the program on the Heritage homepage for your future reference following today's presentations. And we remind our internet viewers that we're happy to have questions or comments submitted at any time, simply emailing speaker at heritage.org. Hosting our program today is Becky Norton Dunlop, Vice President for External Relations here at Heritage. Mrs. Dunlop oversees our strategic outreach and communication, both nationally and internationally, to conservative public policy institutions, other leadership organizations, as well as policy activists. Prior to joining Heritage, she was Secretary of Natural Resources for the Commonwealth of Virginia in the cabinet of Governor George Allen. Before that, she served several positions in the Reagan administration, starting as Deputy Assistant to the President for Presidential Personnel, later Special Assistant and Director of his Cabinet Office, then Senior Special Assistant to Attorney General Ed Meese, and concluded her term there as Deputy Undersecretary of the Department of the Interior and Assistant Secretary for Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. Please join me in welcoming Becky Norton Dunlop. Becky? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, John, and let me add my words of welcome to all of you who are here and those of you who will be watching this um, online or on a DVD later. Thank you so much for attending. Uh, I was delighted to uh, be contacted by one of my colleagues with the Discovery Institute uh, and asked if I would be willing to host a program with uh, John West, who has added a chapter to his book. Uh, so those of you who follow what's going on at Heritage closely know that he has been here previously to talk about his book. Uh, but I think the chapter is an important chapter, and I was delighted to uh, host this event today. Uh, John West is a vice president and senior fellow at the Seattle-based Discovery Institute, where he also serves as assistant director, associate director of the Institute's Center for Science and Culture. His current research examines the impact of science and scientism on public policy and culture. His other areas of expertise include constitutional law, American government, and institutions, and religion and politics. Dr. West was previously an associate professor of political science at Seattle Pacific University, where he chaired the Department of Political Science and Geography, and he has taught political science and history courses at California State University, uh, San Bernardino, and Azusa Pacific University from 1986 to 1989. Dr. West served as managing editor of Public Research Syndicated, which distributes essays on public affairs to more than 700 daily and weekly newspapers. He has written or edited 12 books, uh, most recently The Magician's Twin, C.S. Lewis on Science, Scientism, and Society. Uh, he holds a Ph.D. in government from Claremont Graduate University and a B.A. in communications from the University of Washington. He is a recipient of several academic fellowships, including a Haynes Foundation dissertation grant, an Earhart Foundation fellowship, a Richard Weaver fellowship, and a Chevron Journalism Economic Scholarship. He is a member of Pi Sigma Alpha and Phi Beta Kappa. Uh, let me say before I invite him to the uh, podium uh, that um, one of the unique things about his book, uh, Darwin Day in America is the number of footnotes at the end. Now, I don't know how many of you regularly read books uh, or scientific documents, but footnotes are important. Uh, they, they tell you that the person writing the book has actually uh, done a lot of research and, and made connections with other writings on the topic. And uh, this book has over 100 pages of footnotes. So once you finish reading the book, you're not finished. And I think that's uh, an important point to make. Uh, let me say also that here at the Heritage Foundation, we are guided by principles. Uh, and particularly in the area of energy and environment, uh, we have identified <clears throat> eight key principles 
One of those principles is that people are our most important, unique, and valuable resource. And another is that science should be a tool that's used to guide public policy, not run public policy. But the important point I would make about that is science is a result of the scientific method. And I think sometimes uh, we in the United States of America, given all the press reported today on scientific subjects, lose fact of that definition. So I'm delighted to bring uh, Dr. West to our podium today uh, to talk about scientism uh, in the age of Obama. Dr. John West. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you for the very gracious introduction and also for letting you know that although my book is over 500 pages, since there are 100 pages of footnotes, you actually don't have to read those, uh, although you're welcome to dig into those. It's, uh, so there's not quite as much other material to read, might, which might make it a little less daunting. I want to give you greetings from Discovery Institute. Uh, for those of you who don't know about Discovery, we were started in 1990 by Bruce Chapman and George Gilder. And uh, we deal not just in the science and culture area, but technology policy. Uh, actually have a DC-based uh, expert in that, Hans Haney, uh, George Gilder, Michael Medved is a senior fellow. Uh, then on the science and culture side, we have people like Steve Meyer, uh, Michael Behe, and Bill Dembski, Jay Richards, uh, some names that you may know. But yes, the topic this morning is scientism in the age of Obama, which is particularly appropriate today because as we're meeting, uh, something called the White House Science Fair is going on, and in fact, the president was supposed to begin speaking on that just a few minutes ago. And this is one of the indications of how important science is uh, in the rhetoric, at least, of, of this uh, presidency. But I want to go back, uh, as I start, to, and this is an earlier in the Obama administration, it was actually the administration's very first year, and the White House was looking for a way to promote its health care agenda. So it invited a group of doctors to the White House to hear the president advocate for his reforms. The doctors were apparently told to wear white lab coats, presumably to end an aura of scientific authority to the event. The imagery of science, in fact, was so important that doctors who showed up in business suits were handed fake lab coats to put on. There actually is a photo of this happening and fake lab coats being handed out in the Rose Garden, but it was too expensive for me to license just for this talk. You can find it on the internet. This is a uh, public domain photo by the White House phot photographer. I think for obvious reasons, the photographer didn't take a photo of the lab coats being handed out. Now, this is just one story, but I do think it is revealing. During his first inaugural address, uh, President Obama pledged to restore science to its rightful place. In the years that have followed, his administration has attempted to claim for itself the mantle of scientific authority like no other presidency in American history. Yet despite the Obama administration's scientific rhetoric, I would argue, and will argue, uh, that its actual record on scientific issues tells a far different story, a story of the repeated misuse of science for uh, its ideological ends. This misuse of science has manifested itself in at least six ways. First, we've seen the administration appoint ideologues to key science policy positions, most notably physicist John Holdren as director of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. Now, Holdren unquestionably has a distinguished scientific pedigree from Harvard and other places. He also, however, has a long record of scientific doomsaying and authoritarianism. In a book of readings he co-edited in the 1970s, he warned of catastrophic global cooling which he worried could lead to a new global ice age that would produce a giant dump of ice into the ocean. I guess that would produce a big splash or something. But anyway, he said it could generate a tidal wave of proportions unprecedented in recorded history. Those are his words. Along with regular prophecies of doom, however, Holdren promoted various authoritarian schemes in the name of science. In 1977, he co-authored a book that seemed to recommend compulsory population control, arguing that counting on voluntary family planning programs to reduce population growth would be a serious mistake. He went on to propose that we should discourage marriage by imposing high marriage fees, and that we should discourage children by raising, these are his words again, taxes on luxury baby goods and toys. 
He had little patience for those who might believe that family size should not be none of the government's business. As he put it, the number of children in a family is a matter of profound public concern. Why should the law not be able to prevent a person from having more than two children? Holdren also proposed transferring political power from America's democratically elected leaders to what he called, in his words, a planetary regime, which he defined as an international body that would control the development, administration, conservation, and distribution of all natural resources, control all international trade, and last but certainly not least, be given responsibility for determining the optimum population for the world and for each region. This man is now our government's top official in the area of science policy. And if you don't think that matters, listen on. A second way the Obama administration has misused science has been its willingness to stretch the data in service of its goals. In 2014, John Holdren became embroiled in controversy because he tried to capitalize on the weather as evidence of the growing impact of global warming. As even some global warming advocates conceded, those claims were pretty much scientifically suspect. During the winter of last year, Holdren released a short video hyping the purported link between warming and extreme cold weather events. A few weeks later, five distinguished climatologists responded in the journal Science, quote, as climate scientists, we share the prevailing view in our community that human-induced global warming is happening. But we consider it unlikely that those consequences will include more frigid winters, unquote. In August of last year, Holdren tried to capitalize on wildfires then blazing throughout western United States by producing a new video titled, It Only Takes Three Minutes to See Why We Must Act on Climate Change. According to the White House, the video was intended to show how climate change is making America's wildfires more dangerous and why we must act now. Unfortunately for Holdren, three new studies released in the same year last year, argued that wildfires were not, in fact, more severe today than they were in the past. In the words of one of the researchers, we have not seen a measurable increase in the size or the severity of fires. In fact, we, what we have actually seen is a deficit in forest fires compared to what early settlers were dealing with. And there's a lot more that can be said on all of this, and lots of footnotes and things that you can go through or during the question period can ask me. A third way we've seen the Obama administration abuse science is enlisting it to justify various forms of coercive utopianism. Witness the administration's dramatic revamp of the school lunch menus and food aid to the poor, all done under the banner of sound science. Now, these changes were implemented to combat obesity, which is obviously a laudable goal, and I'm not against that. But they've been imposed with an indifference to the concerns of ordinary Americans that, frankly, is rather breathtaking. Stories soon began to circulate of students and local school officials protesting the unintended consequences of the new regulations. Photos of sparse and unappetizing meals prepared under the new standards spread across the internet. Even assuming that all the dietary standards were justified by the science, the apparent belief that science alone should determine what every child in the nation may eat is classic overreach. Public policy is largely about reconciling competing goods and attaining the ideal calorie count dictated by a government scientist is surely not the only human good. Other goods might include enjoying appetizing food, uh, exercising local control of schools, freely choosing your own diet, and maintaining the flexibility to tailor uh, your menu to diverse students. As the last point, the administration's one-size-fits-all approach left many students who needed more calories, for example, student athletes and teenage mothers, uh, really with not adequate uh, food. The administration's if we impose it, they will eat it approach wasn't exactly a rousing success. According to government's auditors, more than a million fewer students ate school lunches uh, in the 2012-2013 school year compared to the previous year after years of going up and up and up in uh, enrollment and participation. Now, a fourth way the Obama administration has misused science has been a staggering lack of transparency at the Environmental Protection Agency. The EPA has faced repeated demands from Congress to disclose the data it used to establish sweeping new air pollution standards. Congress wanted the data released 
so that outside reviewers could evaluate whether the EPA standards were justified based on the, the data that they said it was based on. Yet for over a year, EPA officials stonewalled. When Congress continued to press the issue uh, and actually filed subpoenas, <laughs> EPA had Gina McCarthy unleashed a furious attack in a speech before the National Academy of Sciences. Lauding science as our professor and our protector, she denounced those seeking transparency and justified the EPA's secrecy as an effort to, as she put it, protect confidential personal health data from those who are not qualified to analyze it, which in her view appeared to be anyone who might disagree with the administration. Regardless of where you or what you view the final regulations on this and whether you think they're good or bad, I would hope that we could all agree that this kind of secrecy is not something appropriate for a free society and should be unacceptable and it's not good for science. But perhaps even more disturbing than the administration's secrecy has been its recurring invocation of science as a trump card to override both ethical concerns and religious liberty. This is the fifth way the administration, I think, has misused science. An especially egregious case is the administration's mandate on employers to include potentially abortion-inducing drugs in their health care plans. It's interesting to see how the administration justified this rhetorically when it was initially put out. Cat scientists have abundant evidence that birth control has significant health benefits for women, declared uh, Kathleen Sebelius, the Secretary of Health and Human Services at the time. Basically, so the argument went like this. Scientists supports contraception. Thus, employers, including many religious employers, ought to be compelled to provide drugs that may induce abortions. End of discussion. In the administration's view, science trumped both ethics and the rights of religious conscience. Just how far some administration officials are willing to take the idea that science should override ethical concerns became apparent after the disclosure of a multi-year experiment involving more than 1,300 premature infants funded by the National Institutes of Health. As part of this experiment, premature infants were randomly assigned to receive higher or lower levels of oxygen. Those receiving lower levels of oxygen were more likely to die, while those receiving higher levels uh, were more likely to have serious eye damage that could lead to blindness. Parents were not informed of the possible increased risk of death for infants enrolled in the study, nor were many informed about a key part of the study's design that deprived their children of individualized treatment if they signed up for it. Researchers recalibrated oxygen equipment used in the study so it would generate false readings in order to prevent medical staff from adjusting oxygen levels based on the individual needs of the infants under their care. Now, this study actually started during the Bush administration, but it was the Obama administration officials who had to respond once it became public and, and one part of the government raised ethical objections to it. And they had a choice, acknowledge there's a problem and fix it, or basically circle the wagons, you know, claim that the people against her are anti-science, deny wrongdoing. As I write about in my new chapter, they chose the latter option. Chief among the boosters of the study was, in fact, Francis Collins, head of the National Institutes of Health. Now, again, I fully acknowledge the goal of this medical study being a worthy one, better treatment for premature infants. But there are some things you're not supposed to be allowed to do to your fellow human beings, no matter how laudable your goal. Human infants are not guinea pigs. At least they shouldn't be. And the efforts of the Obama administration, particularly uh, uh, Dr. Collins, to undermine the ethical parts of the government, the ethics office that was actually raising objections to this and wanted changes, is really disturbing and should be disturbing regardless of where you fall on the political spectrum. Finally, the Obama administration has tried to enlist science in the broader culture wars. One example I highlight in my book is the decision of the White House to actually seek out the producers of last year's Cosmos television series, hosted by physicist Neil deGrasse Tyson. The White House wanted the president to tape, and he did, an official introduction to the series, and producers agreed. Cosmos portrayed religion as the enemy of science, claimed that science shows how life originated through blind and unguided processes, and even compared climate change skeptics to Nazis. 
that a sitting president of the United States would use the power of his office to sell this series to the American public is remarkable and revealing. Yet as I point out in my book, in many ways, the Obama administration's record on science reflects trends that span both political parties and have become ever more pronounced during the last several years. Our culture is witnessing the second coming of what I would call totalitarian science. You can also call it just scientism, but the reason I use the word totalitarian science is that it's a view of science as so totalistic in its outlook that its defenders claim the right to remake every sphere of human life from public policy to education to ethics to religion. And I think the evidence for this overreach in the name of science is all around us. In the area of ecology, there are increasing calls for coercive measures to control human population in order to save the non-human life on the planet. Eric Pianca at the University of Texas, for example, one of the nation's leading research institutions, urges the reduction of the, humans of the Earth's human population by 90% and calls on the government to confiscate all the earnings of any couple who has more than two children. You should have to pay more when you have your first kid. You pay more taxes, he insists. When you have your second kid, you pay a lot more taxes. And when you have your third kid, you don't get anything back. They take it all, unquote. Tax dollars at work. Tenured professor at the State Research University. Underlying much of this new hatred for humans is a virulent form of social Darwinism that denies that humans are unique or worthy of special care. This Darwinian denial of human exceptionalism can be found on both sides of the political spectrum. On the left, we have Princeton bioethicist Peter Singer, author of a book called A Darwinian Left. Singer argues that the life of a newborn baby is of less value than the life of a pig, a dog, or a chimpanzee. Now, where does he get this idea? Well, he explained in an interview that he got it here. For him, he said, Darwin's theory undermined the foundations of our traditional Western way of thinking about the place of our species in the universe. On the right, we have John Derbyshire, formerly a longtime writer for National Review until being dismissed in 2012 after authoring an article for another publication arguing that blacks are more antisocial and less intelligent than whites. Derbyshire argues that racial differences are the products of evolution. He also believes that Darwinian theory refutes the claim of traditional Western monotheism that human beings are exceptional. As he wrote, the broad outlook on human nature implied by Darwinian ideas contradicts the notion of human exceptionalism without which the Abrahamic religions lose their point. And he thinks that's a good thing. Outside the area of ecology, scientism has continued to expand in the area of medicine and bioethics, where the old idea of eugenics is being revived in the name of good science. Nancy Snyderman, chief medical editor for NBC News, has publicly defended eliminating handicapped babies through abortion. Why? On the basis of science. In her words, I am pro-science, so I believe that this is a great way to prevent disease. Of course, if it's pro-science to support eradicating babies with genetic flaws, it must be anti-science to oppose it. The growing militancy of scientism can also be seen in renewed claims that faith and science are incompatible. Last year, the University of Washington evolutionary psychologist from my hometown, uh, David Barish, took to the pages of the New York Times to explain the talk he gives to students at the beginning of each academic year, more of our tax dollars at work. The talk he wrote isn't as you might expect about sex. The, it instead is about evolution and religion and how they get along. More to the point, how they don't. Barish's take home point for students, the more we know of evolution, the more unavoidable is the conclusion that living things, including human beings, are the, produced by a natural, totally amoral process with no indication of a benevolent controlling creator. Now, Barish is a scientist who resides in politically and socially progressive Seattle. But even in the nation's heartland, even in humanities classes, this science refutes religion message is becoming a prominent theme at colleges and universities. And I give a lot more details and statistics and things in my book, but I just want to highlight a couple of examples here. At Ball State University in Indiana, and what could be more heartland than that? 
We have an English professor who teaches an honors course called Dangerous Ideas. The sole textbook for the course is an anthology edited by a prominent atheist in which various authors assert that science must destroy religion. Or there is no God, no intelligent designer, no higher purpose to our lives. And even that scientists should function as our society's high priests. Now, I'm not against students studying uh, books like this, but it's interesting that you have a course where that is the only text and that is the only view. Um, that's certainly not a dispassionate study of you know, the debate. I think we can expect that this gospel of what I might call scientific materialism uh, to be spread to still younger students in future years. Boston University psychologist Deborah Kellerman conducts research showing that children, in her words, may be intuitive theists because they're predisposed to see nature as the product of design and purpose. In her view, rather than something to be celebrated, this finding is a cause for serious alarm. So she believes science educators need to be more aggressive in reaching students at younger and younger ages. And she actually recommends staging storybook interventions with elementary school children to convince them that nature is the product of unguided processes. And this has moved just uh, not just in the academic journals, although she's written quite a bit on this, but uh, in a year or two ago, this was featured in the Wall Street Journal. So it's actually breaking out more mainstream. Interestingly, while the proponents of scientism continue to become more radicalized and evangelizing for their views, their efforts to deny free speech to anyone who disagrees with them or disagrees with the purported scientific consensus in any given topic are also becoming more extreme. Testifying before Congress in 2011, John Holdren tried to explain to congressmen why they should disregard the views of scientists skeptical of various claims about climate change. There are always heretics, he said. I think that was another revealing comment. Classifying those who disagree with certain scientific claims, not merely as dissenters, not merely as people who disagree with you, but as heretics. Once scientism turns science into dogma, disagreement does become tantamount to heresy. The very issue Holdren was testifying about climate change provides a rather disturbing example. Uh, one of America's leading newspapers, the Los Angeles Times, announced in 2013 it would no longer publish letters to the editor that expressed any skepticism about the human role in climate change. Since one of the original purposes of printing letters to the editor is to air community viewpoints that might differ from a newspaper's own position, this decision by the Times represented a dramatic departure from the historic canons of journalism, at least in the recent past. Others go considerably further, calling for the prosecution of global warming skeptics. So last year, we have Professor Lawrence Torricello at the Rochester Institute of Technology publishing an essay urging that global warming skeptics who receive funding for their work be charged with criminal negligence. Astoundingly, Professor Torcello labels any criticism of his proposal on the grounds of free speech as misguided. Apparently, again, if you think people like that should have free speech, you're, uh, the, the, you know, free speech doesn't apply <laughs> to these people. Journalist Adam Weinstein published a follow-up essay in which he declared that global warming skeptics should face jail. They should face jail. They should face fines. They should face lawsuits. Unfortunately, as some of you probably know, this is already happening. The journal National Review is currently fighting potentially ruinous litigation from Penn State University climatologist Michael Mann, one of the leading global warming activists in academia, because National Review writers vigorously criticize his research. Now, other than climate change, I would argue that the science topic on which intimidation and censorship is probably the most rampant right now is the debate over whether there is evidence of intelligent design and purpose in nature. Eric Hedin is an associate professor of physics at Ball State University in Indiana. He's an outstanding scientist with a long list of peer-reviewed publications. For many years, he taught an interdisciplinary honors class it was basically a science and society class, so it wasn't a straight science class. And this class was called the boundaries of science that explored the limits of science. What can we know from science? What do issues does it raise for larger you know, social questions? During one small part of the course, I think it was one week, 
He discussed the debate over intelligent design in physics and cosmology, not biology, issues like fine-tuning of the universe for life. Hadeen's course received positive student reviews, especially from students who told him that, uh, you know, what they were experiencing in other classes, where they were getting force-fed the sort of scientific materialism, this was a refreshing change that they could hear another side. However, in 2013, atheist evolutionary biologist, not physicist, atheist evolutionary biologist Jerry Coyne at the University of Chicago and the Freedom From Religion Foundation, a group so extreme that at the same time it was trying to get Ohio to remove a Star of David from a planned Holocaust memorial. These were the two groups, or two, an individual in the group, who complained. They lodged complaints. Now, in the normal course of affairs, the university would say, tough. But in this case, Hadeen's class was eventually canceled. In addition, the university precedent imposed a campus speech code, not only banning professors from discussing intelligent design in science classes, at least if they weren't going to attack it, but banning professors from expressing support or sympathy for the concept in social science and humanities classes. But again, not stopping them from attacking it. Recall that Ball State is the same university that has allowed an English professor to teach a course emphasizing that science must destroy religion. When it comes to academic freedom, some professors are freer than others. David Coppedge was a senior computer systems administrator for the Cassini mission to Saturn in NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab uh, in California. He faced demotion and discharge after he offended his supervisor by occasionally offering to loan colleagues DVDs about intelligent design. This was offered like during lunch or during sort of uh, time outside of sort of normal work. But when the supervisor found out, uh, Coppedge basically faced a witch hunt. His employment evaluations, which had been outstanding, uh, suddenly, within the next year, took a nosedive and he ultimately lost his job. Now, his dismissal was justified as a budgetary reduction unrelated to his views on intelligent design, but uh, that explanation was hardly credible given the overall facts of the case that came out. Some activists are now engaging what are essentially mob actions to muzzle uh, intelligent design supporters. Stanley Wilson is a biologist who is scheduled to teach a course on the debate over evolution and intelligent design at Amarillo College in Texas. The seminar was to be offered as a non-credit personal enrichment course for adult education. But then members of a so-called freethinkers group threatened the college, saying that if the course went ahead, they would disrupt the class. So the college canceled it. I mean, that really is an essentially a mob action. Now, science is a good thing and nothing I said here should be uh, construed as being anti-science. But this kind of dogmatism and intimidation is not good for science, and it certainly isn't good for a free society. How can we grow in our knowledge? How can we correct wrong ideas? How can we oppose overreach in the name of science if we're denied the right to free and open discussion? That's the foundation for a free society. That's the foundation for the quest for truth. Open discussion is a foundation for genuine progress in science. English philosopher John Stuart Mill stressed in his book On Liberty that freedom to disagree should apply to science just like any other discipline, no matter how sacrosanct the scientific theory. He made this point by referring to the reigning paradigm of his day of Newtonian physics. If even the Newtonian philosophy were not permitted to be questioned, he wrote, Mankind could not feel as complete assurance of its truth as they now do. The beliefs which we have most warrant for have no safeguard to rest on but a standing invitation to the whole world to prove them unfounded. Unfortunately, in the current situation, I think some who ought to recognize the dangers of scientism are being silenced because they fear being labeled anti-science. As a free society, we must not allow ourselves to give in to that kind of intimidation. So what should we do? Well, first, I think we need to directly confront the idea that science says so is a sufficient basis for public policy decisions. Attempting to invoke science to override ethics, religious liberty, or personal freedoms is not science. It's scientism. And challenging such tactics is not anti-science. 
In fact, it's rescuing science from those who would misuse it. Second, we need to insist that public conversations about science be informed by dissenting views. The history of science is littered with views that used to be regarded as the consensus of the scientific community that are no longer regarded, good, regarded as good science. And in the rest of my book, I actually, a lot of it discusses those things, from eugenics to lobotomies to uh, you name it. There are a lot of things that if you just go on the basis of the scientific consensus of the time, that today would be regarded as junk science. Science is a human enterprise. Humans are fallible. That's why on questions of consequence, public officials should not be embarrassed about and in fact should insist on hearing from a variety of thoughtful voices in the scientific community, not just the consensus view. For one thing, hearing from dissenting voices will make those who are embracing the consensus view better in articulating the grounds for their consensus. And if they can't do that, then that's a warning sign that maybe the consensus isn't based just on overwhelming scientific data. Everyone, at least when it comes to debating how many billions of dollars we should spend, what human freedoms we should uh, impinge upon, uh, should be able to articulate and defend the basis for what they're proposing, uh, even against people that they don't think know what they're talking about. Finally, we need to defend the right of scientists and students and ordinary citizens to express their honest views about science and public policy free from intimidation. The idea of free speech in the area of science and public policy may be threatening to certain groups who don't want to be questioned, but it's a basic pillar of a free society. We really need to push back at unjust claims of people being anti-science simply for raising questions. One of my favorite quotes is, a fair result can be obtained only by fully stating and balancing the facts and arguments on both sides of each question. As some of you may know already, or maybe not, these words come from Charles Darwin. And on this point, if not on certain others, I think he was exactly right. The best way to challenge the claims of scientism is to insist that they be subjected to free, open, and vigorous debate. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we're now going to open the floor for questions. Please wait until the microphone arrives with you. Identify yourself, and if you're representing an organization or even employed by an organization that uh, you'd like to identify, we'd like to know who that is. And I see a question here on the front row, uh, which will start us off. So Jim Carafano here at Heritage. So one of the um, different, slightly different, but I, I wonder if there's any of this in the book. So one of the things post 9-11 was there was a lot of scientific information that we needed to withdraw from the public for security reasons. And I just wondered if that's something that you, w w where that trend is going and if it's something that you have observations on. Well, that's a great question. I actually don't deal with it in my book. That, um, that sh could have been a new chapter in and of itself. So I don't, you know, I'm probably not the person to ask on that. I mean, I, I, I say, you know, there are legitimate reasons, some legitimate reasons for secrecy for something. You, know, you don't want someone building an atomic bomb in their backyard. So, frankly, I'm less concerned about some of that than I am, whether it be the EPA or other things. Or the, really, the only justification seems to be that they, they don't like the people who, you know, the people who disagree with them. Like the EPA example is so classic. And, and Gina McCarthy claimed that part of it was about privacy of confidential health data. But uh, if you actually read the documents of what Congress was asking for, they made clear the stuff could be redacted. They made clear that they would work with the EPA to make sure. So this was, that was completely bogus. It had nothing to do about privacy. Uh, so I'm more concerned about th that. But that's a great question. You know, even even national security things can be abused. I, I, I would say that I am somewhat skeptical of some of the intrusive things vis-a-vis -vis email and other things that the government does. I'm, uh, yeah. So, I mean, even that can be abused, yeah. So, great question. Okay, there in the back row, and then we'll come over here to the front. Uh, Jonathan Inbody with the Christian Medical Association. And I wondered if you covered in your book anything regarding sex education, the science, and 
politics there? Oh, yeah. Um, there are actually two chapters uh, on that. Uh, one, I think, Junk Science in the Bedroom, and uh, that actually talks about Kinsey and his followers and, and then how that worked itself out in the 70s, 80s, 90s in actual public policy and the science on which it's based on. And that's a really great example of how mainstream, what's considered mainstream science can be based on junk. And uh, so, I mean, not to give you know, the whole book, but I, those of you who really know about the Kinsey issue, you know that his statistics were based on largely a combination of coerced interviews with undergraduates that, who were intimidated, and then populations of prisoners. And, and uh, in fact, prisoners who were uh, in prison for sex crimes. And then he extrapolated this uh, data to the entire population. And then that was used to justify all sorts of uh, things. Um, for me, in the sexuality area, the thing I cover in the new chapter that I think is the most concerning and isn't on the wavelength of many conservatives yet uh, are these new laws against, they're called you know, sexual orientation change therapy and stop that. And one was passed in New Jersey and signed by Chris Christie, uh, which I think is very unfortunate. Now these are sold based on these lurid stories that, I mean, if were happening, no one would support, and I certainly don't, of you know, electroshock therapy and all the ice baths and all these horrible things. And so if that's what they were just targeting, I'd say they're, that's perfectly legitimate. In my own state where they've tried to pass it, um, they made those claims, but then when they actually asked, well, what's the evidence that this was occurring, the state department that handles the complaints on these things, they had never received one complaint on it. Uh, and so that's not justified, but even more worrisome. Let, let's say, okay, maybe theoretically these have happened sometime by licensed counselors. If you read the text of the laws, they actually don't focus on that. The laws actually prohibit any counseling, verbally, you know, just talking with someone who, not just on sexual orientation issues, but who has gender confusion. So if you have a young man who is really confused about his gender and say, and behavioral issues, so, uh, you know, feels compelled to dress up as a girl but doesn't like it and, and is troubled, if your licensed counselor tries to help him inconsistent with his own religious and moral beliefs to say, well, you know, you don't have to do that. Uh, that is now, you'll lose your licensure in New Jersey and uh, Washington, D.C. and uh, California and other states it has stopped. So I think, and if you actually look at the underlying science on that, which I give citations, it, this, is, this is preposterous. Um, look, sex, I'm not an expert in this area, but I've done enough research. Sexual orientation is, is, a, is a hard issue, um, and I don't um, presume to pretend whether any person can necessarily change their orientation or not. I will say the evidence out there from the, you know, uh, the study of the mass survey of youths at, at risk and some of the other studies is providing pretty clear and convincing evidence that sexual orientation and attraction identity are quite fluid, uh, especially for young people. And so you know, something like 80% of males who, as a 14 or 15, identified say, same-sex orientation primarily within two or three years, almost all of them have, you know, self-identify as heterosexual. This has gotten, the, the, the survey, the research has gotten so clear on some of this, that even some in the LGBTQ mm -hmm. community, I can't always remember all of the, the numbers on there, Lisa Diamond from University of, uh, of Utah, uh, self-identified lesbian, not at all, I, I mean, doesn't, support anything uh, of, say, people who don't support same-sex marriage, and so she's completely against that. But she gave a lecture, I actually quote, and actually I'll just quote her, her, her comment, because it's just really revealing. She warns that they need to drop this idea that sexual orientation as a talking point is absolutely unchangeable, because her research shows the opposite. And as she puts it quite, um, and I'm quoting her, so, Quote, the queers have to stop saying, please help us, we're born this way and we can't change. And she goes on to say, they have to stop doing that because it's going to bite us in the ass because now we know there's enough data out there showing it's not true. So I think this is classic, you know, misuse of science to basically, in this case, to hurt young people from uh, getting help that they want. In most states by your age of 13, 
you have the choice of medical treatment that you want, can't be forced to have that you don't want. And so the only people these laws that Chris Christie signed in New Jersey are going to hurt are, are actually already has. In New Jersey, there was a Catholic teenager who uh, was subject to suicide and some other things, and his parents got him with a licensed counselor who helped him, and he, was, he, he didn't like some of the feelings he was having and helped him, but then when the law was passed, they no longer can have him see a licensed therapist that can counsel him according to his own values in New Jersey. So this impacts real people. But now I've said lots more on it than perhaps I should have. Do you think, do you think some of this um, phenomenon that you're, you're talking about is so widespread, you know, as you, as you yeah. amply um, demonstrated, is due to a sort of a politicization of higher education in this country going back maybe to the 60s? Because I, I'm struck by, I get, occasionally get my old college catalog, I mean, from my old college, I get the catalogs, the update. And, and I'm struck by, you know, the, there'll be like a biology course with some gender emphasis or, or, or an ethnic emphasis. And I just find it bizarre that these kinds of political considerations have filtered into the what used to be called the hard sciences. Is that mm. something you observed? And could that be part of the problem why, uh, why this is uh, this phenomenon? Oh, I'm Milton Grenfell, just a student. I mean, a student of human nature and society. I'm not a, um, I'm not with any think tanker. You know, I think that, that actually could play into it. But as I show in my book, from pretty early on, I mean, we're talking the end of the 19th century. You know, when the sort of modern biological chemical sciences really you know took off. I mean, obviously there was a lot happening before then, but. Uh, you had the use of, or I'd say misuse of science in public policy. And the big, biggest example from the late 19th, early 20th century for about four decades in America and elsewhere was eugenics. And often, uh, one of the things I do in my book is try to correct the record because often eugenics is described, if, if you're trained as a scientist, you know a little bit about eugenics and the message you take from that is, well, this was politicians abusing science. Well, there's certainly what that is part of the story. But the part that you don't learn, which would be more helpful for our scientists to learn because it might give them a reality check, is that the, the leaders, the, the intellectual leaders of eugenics who are arguing, were the leading evolutionary biologists at Princeton, Yale, Harvard, Columbia, members of the National Academy of Sciences. And they were trumpeting this new age of science as being the be-all, end-all to answer all social questions. And in fact, I cite some early addresses from the early part of the 20th century by uh, heads of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and things about how science is going to be our savior basically on everything, that I, I think, you know, it predates the 1960s. Um, the aggressive use, and again, I'm not, science obviously has an important role to play in public policy, so I'm not against that, but the, the use of really stretching it beyond what the science actually shows and, and not being particularly... Uh, sophisticated about that that's happening uh, goes back a long ways. So, in my view. Yeah. Okay, right here, and then we have uh, someone on the back row over there. Yeah. Hello, I'm Blanford Robinson, and I'm just generally interested in sure. intelligent design issues, mm -hmm. whether cosmology or sure. biology. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, one of the things that keeps me up at night these days is intelligent design and cosmology mm -hmm. and um, the push forward of multiverse theory that mm -hmm. seems to be um, um, barreling forward like a locomotive. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, and uh, I guess it hasn't been called a fact yet. Uh -huh. And I'm curious um, when it will be considered a fact, but yeah. beyond, beyond that. Um, also, I've, I've been very impressed with the amount of new information coming out about um, cellular biology, information in the cell, and um, what we'd look at as design in, in human biology. And I, in my own bubble, I sense that there's progress being made. I was curious if you could comment on whether you think real progress is being made from a public perception or from, yeah. is there a momentum gathering yeah. from your perspective? You sure. probably have a better idea than oh. I do. Well, lots there. Um, I'll try to be quick on this. Uh, first of all, since I'm not a scientist, although we have 40 affiliated people who are scientists, I'm not the best person to address these things, but I do want to say a couple things. Um, with regard to cosmology and uh, multiple universes, there's a lot of debate over that. I'd refer you, uh, actually ISI Books, who published my book, also published a book called Nature of Nature, and there are some essays in there, particularly a couple by Bruce Gordon, 
that deal with the multiverse question, and one of the points he makes is that even if you accept the multiverse, it actually doesn't end up getting rid of the fine-tuning problem because those, those other universes, if they're going to have life or other things, it, it, you're going to have the same issues with them. So ultimately, it doesn't get a ri rid of the design question. And so it's a very interesting argument. His, uh, can be challenging to me because he's so <laughs> knowledgeable. But I, so I think even if it were true, now, uh, whether or not it's true or not, I, I, it seems to me that there's a lot of debate over there, and just as a lowly social scientist, that a lot of the arguments offered for it are because they're trying to escape a certain conclusion. You know, the evidence points in one way, and this is their escape hatch. Uh, so, but there's, a, I would refer to some of the stuff by Bruce Gordon. On the broader thing, I think we are seeing some positive indications. And this is an area I know conservatives are divided on, but I'd encourage conservatives, say, who, who don't, uh, or you know, think that intelligent design is, is pseudoscience or, or something, is that don't play into this debate that the only two choices you have are science or anti-science. What I was trying to show here is that actually, when, whenever you hear that rhetoric, I mean, the number of people who are genuinely anti-science in our culture is, you know, there are a few who could perhaps be described that way, but they are not a significant part of our culture. And so whenever you see a debate where those are the only two options being presented in the general you know, conversation, usually there's some, a lot more that's happening there. And I'd say design is one of them. But there are some positive indications. I think for us, one of the most positive indications was the debate spurred by uh, the second book published by philosopher of science Stephen Meyer called uh, Darwin's Doubt, which dealt with the origin of new body plans during the Cambrian explosion some 530 million years ago. What was interesting about that was, first of all, some of the people who were willing to come out of the closet and endorse the book as serious to read, for example, Harvard geneticist George Church, he's not an intelligent science supporter, doesn't necessarily, actually doesn't go the full way with Steve uh, Meyer, but he thought the book was making really serious uh, points and challenges that needed to be considered, and so he was willing to put his name on encouraging people to read it. Uh, there were some other uh, people, uh, including a uh, paleontologist who co-authored a major book on the origin of uh, animals uh, with Columbia University Press. And so the people who are willing to actually come out of the closet, so to speak, and say, actually, no, th there are some really serious issues being debated about whether unguided processes like natural selection acting on random mutations can really build you know, new form and function in the level that you would have to have had in the history of life, I think that is very positive. Now, you still have what I would call the Darwin Amen Chorus, which often is really far um, behind the times. And, you know, the public spokespeople for, for Darwin that are the talking heads are often really behind the times on things. I, mean, I even think of someone, although he's better on it now, Francis Collins, who as a, uh, as a, has been a theistic critic, say, of, of intelligent design. In his book, Language of God, he was touting the old junk DNA paradigm, that most of our you know, genome, because it doesn't code for protein, therefore must be junk and happenstance. He himself won't use that term anymore. Uh, in fact, he himself was at NIH and at the Genome Project was one of the you know, uh, if you're the overall director, your name gets put on all the research. So uh, a lot of the studies that came out actually refuting a lot of that paradigm, his name was on it, even as he was promoting it as a reason to, you know, say that life wasn't the product of intentional design. But, you know, he's now grown and won't use that argument. But I, So there's a lot of sloppiness among the public debate. So I, I do think it's still there's a lot that can be done to filter out. But the one thing I'd ask of conservatives who might not agree with intelligent design is to, again, don't fall into the trap of when you start hearing this rhetoric that your only choices are science or anti-science, or on the Darwin debate, the only choice is to have the most literalistic reading of Genesis and everything started six to 10,000 years ago. That's not my view. Um, and I'm not saying you know that I think we're a free country, people can believe what they want, but to say that you either believe that or you accept sort of the Dawkins-esque view of, you know, unguided processes are sufficient to, that is, you know, that's really not helpful. And so all I'd ask is of the conservatives who disagree with intelligence design to at least agree 
you know, the common ground approach that people ought to, you know, people like uh, Erica Dean, who isn't even talking about biology, ought to have the same rights, uh, you know, to talk about fine tuning in physics that his atheist colleagues are given at his same state university. So. Uh, Walter Weber, American Center for Law and Justice, and thank you oh, for yeah. a wonderful oh, presentation. Sure. Uh, one area I was wondering if you could address in your book is the politicization of funding priorities for research and science. I mean, the classic example is when, when the, the AIDS came out and suddenly all the money gets pointed towards, yeah. you had to connect your research to AIDS or it wouldn't yeah. get money. And, and other areas where it's, it's totally radioactive to even look mm -hmm. into, for example, the scientific or epidemiological downsides of the sexual revolution. Yeah. I don't know that I have much unique to say on that. You're exactly right. And in the areas that I've seen, say, Darwinian biology is a good example of, I mean, one of our fellows is a tenured biologist at a state university. And often in the research he publishes, they have to add, like what he'll say, the, the doctrinal statement. E even if his research has nothing to do with natural selection or random uh, mutation. And actually, if anything, is explicating, is reverse engineering biological system and is based on a design approach, you have to stick in one or two sentences to basically pay homage to the existing paradigm in order to get it published. And it's similar for, you're exactly right, on funding and other things. And that, that's not helpful, um, especially if you see how much science has progressed in the last, say, two centuries, most of which or, or, you know, most of that time, it wasn't with huge government funds or, or huge funding. And now, um, it becomes so politicized, I mean, actually trying to get new ideas, even in the non-politicized areas that the group think is so, is so strong, trying to get new ideas is uh, through or even considered is, is hard. And uh, so... Okay, well, I think we need to thank our uh, guest here, John West, for an excellent presentation. Thank you so much thank for being you. here at Heritage. Thank you. thank you each for being here today and for your wonderful questions. And I believe we have copies of the book uh, available outside if you're interested. Uh, and we hope to see you again at a Heritage Foundation event. Good day.